First of all, thank you very much. Um, um, and um, I normally feel a lot better than I look. Um, uh... <laughs> That's a very odd place to receive a carpet burn, Mr Gove. Another Labour MP gets onto that, but let's start with a point of order from last Tuesday in the House of Commons from Labour MP Alex Cunningham about the scandal surrounding the Teesside Freeport project. Also, wait till the end to watch what I feel a Tory MP says the quiet bit out loud on the matter of free ports. The Financial Times are reporting that Teesworks Limited, the so-called public-private partnership to redevelop the former steelworks site on Teesside, has reported an exceptional year, tripling its profits to £54 million. Sadly, the public will see very little of that hard cash, as under the Tees Tory mayor, 90% of the shares in the company were handed over to two local businessmen. That means they get £48.6 million and the public get just £5.4 million. Personally, I think that is scandalous. Now, Mr Speaker, when my honourable friend, the member for Middlesbrough, and I raised questions about the way business is done at Teesworks, the Secretary of State for Leveling Up Housing and Communities ordered an inquiry which was expected to have reported by now. Can you please advise me if you have had any plans by the Secretary of State to come to this House to make a statement about why it has been delayed and when we can expect it? Yeah. Thank you. Can I first of all say I have had no indication from the government that the Secretary of State intends to make a statement on this matter. I'll leave that there because Lindsay Hall didn't really say anything interesting other than um, maybe he should maybe ask for an urgent question on this matter. But the next day, Michael Gove was a witness at a Business and Trade Committee meeting on the subject of the performance of investment zones and free ports in England, where Labour MP and Labour addressed the elephant in the room. It's good to see you this morning, Secretary of State. I hope you're feeling a lot better than perhaps you look. Thank you. Um... Don't mean your words, Ian. Just say what you mean. To be fair, Ian, he did genuinely mean it as well. He then brought up the other elephant in a long-winded way in the room that was Teesside. After asking this, Michael then returned the compliment. First of all, thank you very much. Um, um, and um, I normally feel a lot better than I look. Um, uh... <laughs> oh, you know, lovely. Well, Ian Lavery then carried on his line of questioning about the Tees Valley scandal. But it was then the chair, Liam Byrne, who carried on with this clear Tory corruption line. So sit back and enjoy watching our Minister for Leveling Up really squirm. Mwah. So many of those questions are now begged by the publication of the Teesworks accounts, the first mm. year of those accounts. Have you read those accounts? I have not. Um, are you familiar with what they say? Um, uh, broadly familiar, yes. So, as you all know, the piece of land which is on the maps mm. here um, 110 acres has basically been bought by a company, 90% owned by friends and close associates of Lord Houchin, at a pound an acre. A pound an acre, that's 110 acres. There was then a leasing deal and some rights over scrap metal on the site. That together means that the company, 90% owned by these associates, has a turnover of £143 million and about £50 million in profit in one year that has largely now gone out to these private shareholders. In your view, at first blush, does that sound like best value was secured for taxpayers? I can't answer that question, as you know, because um, while this inquiry is going on, what I mustn't do is preempt or end run its conclusions. Separately, um, as I mentioned to Ian, um, I am a huge champion of what Ben Hatchin has done. Were I in any other role other than this one, I would be more than happy to mount not just a defence, but a vigorous and energetic defence of the approach that he has taken throughout. But serious issues have been raised. Ian and you have articulated them. We take them seriously, and that is why we want the report to do its work properly and then conclude and I can't, and I know it's frustrating, it's frustrating for me, as it must be for the no, committee, no. I can't, um, before, <coughs> what you were inviting me to do, in a perfectly legitimate question, of course, is to say, 
It's to look at the headline on a press report from a trial. It's not a press report, it's a set of company accounts. And what it says is that in one year, a company that's bought 110 acres for a pound an acre is now turning over 143 million and shoveling 50 million pounds out to private shareholders in profits. And I guess my question to you is, are you confident that we have secured best value for tax players? Let me put the question another way. Have you got full confidence in the governance of Tees Work Limited today? Again, you're asking me a question about this particular uh, issue, which an investigation is currently um, looking at in detail, from this committee's point of view, perhaps excessive detail. To ask me to preempt it um, would be... Uh, well, it's legitimate to ask, but it would be wrong for me to preempt it. Okay. Well, let me ask you whether you've got full confidence in uh, Lord Houchin's conduct in relation <coughs> to this matter. I do. Yes, I have the highest regard for him. But what I don't want to do is, by anything that I say, to um, preempt the conclusions of the investigation. Um, and and uh, I can speak on a personal level. You can. And I can say that I have the highest... You're even protected by parliamentary privilege here. I have the highest regard for Ben in all of my observations and dealings with him. I think that he is a first-rate public servant who's been responsible for the economic transformation of the Tees Valley. Um, And uh, he is a great and visionary leader in local government. You must accept when there are such heightened concerns about, for example, the PPE contracts, when we have a deal like this that appears to be rooting £50 million in profit on a very strange deal that has released 110 acres for a pound an acre, there are real concerns about whether taxpayer interest has been safeguarded. And my question to you is, do you have full confidence in whether the arrangements have secured best value for taxpayers? Um, I'd say two things. Um, The reason why the inquiry has been set up is to establish that. You mentioned PPE, again, perfectly legitimately. Because I do know something, about the disjuncture between the reporting of what happened with PPE and the reality, then I know that many of the judgments that people have made there, on the basis of what they've read and what's been reported, are utterly at variance with the truth. Well, to, to be fair, I'm merely quoting from the company accounts. Indeed. They've only been published for one year, and they were published two, two or three no, days ago. Uh, my experience, and, and it, I, I believe, Chair, it's helpful that you've made that analogy. My experience is that there have been some people who have quoted facts, unambiguous facts, relating to the procurement of PPE, but those facts quoted in isolation have given a wholly erroneous picture of the procurement decisions that were made and the context in which they were made. But there remain questions in your mind about whether the taxpayer's interest has been best safeguarded. Uh, Again, uh, by definition... Setting up an inquiry is there to satisfy other people's uh, uh, questions, and I have to avoid... You must be curious. I'm endlessly curious, but you're you're trying brilliantly to get me to uh, preempt or to end run the conclusions of an independent inquiry. You'll, you'll, You'll see... And I won't. Here is a, a case where company accounts have been produced that mm. show some pretty strange behaviour. They don't appear to say on the face of it that the taxpayer interest has been safeguarded. You have chosen not to invite the NAO to come in and have a look mm. at this in detail. That raises questions about whether Freeport governance as a policy mm. is in a good place. Yeah, well, I think the key thing is that the, the issues raised all relate to activity before the establishment of the Freeport. That's not quite true, because some of the money that has gone in through the Freeport, mm. I think it's about £21 million, £21.5 million mm. pounds from the Freeport, has mm. gone into the land remediation mm. on the site. And that was yes. actually produced to us in the evidence that they mm. submitted to us. Yeah. The, 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 the South Tees Development Corporation was set up in it before the Freeport was established. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that I would say is, um, there was... You know what, Mike, Mike, you're not inviting us to believe that there are no advantages associated with the free port that have not flattered the value of the land in question? I'm, I'm, I'm saying two things. The first is that there was a previous and unrelated allegation about crustacean deaths related to the free port and Ben. My belief is, on the basis of all of the evidence, that this was a politically motivated attack 
on Ben for a variety of reasons. There was no evidence at all that those crustacean deaths had anything to do with the economic activity I, of the I think we need to be diverted by crustacean deaths. The no, I think it's about best, best value for the taxpayer. No, I think it's critical here because, and it's not a point that um, uh, an allegation or a criticism that I would lay at this committee's door or at your door or at Ian's door, because I think there are legitimate questions. But it is the case that because of Ben's success, he has attracted political opposition. That political opposition has leapt on phenomena and uh, reporting in order to try to uh, uh, besmirch his name. In, and in, and the, one of the reasons why Ben himself wanted an inquiry is because he is confident that some of the lurid allegations that have been made against him are not justified by the as, facts. As, as we stand today, is the Teesside free port still a flagship case study for your free port policy? Yes. Now, I thought Liam Byrne was absolutely brilliant, made our carpet burn Gove look incredibly uncomfortable, and Gove did his absolute slippery best to stay well away from this bit of very clear Tory corruption with dead cat excuses and victimhood. Now, the one thing I really do enjoy about select committee meetings is you get to see different sides of MPs you wouldn't normally see within the chamber. Tory MP for totes, that's how he spell it, I don't know. Anthony Magnell said something in between the conversations about cutting taxes, tax cuts, tax cuts, tax cuts, all you ever heard. For me, he said the quiet bit out loud about why they're desperate for free ports. But the Secretary said you are a free marketeer, you believe in government not being too prescriptive, I mm. would hope and believe that you would take that approach. Is there a danger that we are being too prescriptive in terms of the areas uh, that have been identified in investment zones? Are we saying, are we not allowing market forces to come up with the industries that we'd like to see created? Hmm, that statement spoke volumes of deregulated rules within business, small government, and let the markets run themselves without having to deal with pesky rules and regulations that will hinder big businesses and profits and sod everyone else. Very interesting. But what do you guys think? Also, what's the betting that this report on this scandal see in the light of day before the next election? I'd say don't hold your breath. But what do you guys think? Let me know down below and I shall bid you farewell and take care, my friends.